So we're going to continue now with the rest of the soundtracks on vinyl LP that I've picked up and accumulated over the years. Uh, going in sort of a bit of a different order, starting with a couple uh, series and uh, directors that I kind of group some of their films together because they share composers and such. Um, starting off with the first one, this is just one I, I kind of put at the front because I just I group all these three scores together and uh, one is one of my all-time favorites which is this one here is the original US mono LP on Decca Records of John Barry's score for the immortal Ipcrest file uh, this is one of if not um, I'd, I'd be hard-pressed to name my favorite film score but if I had to name my favorite non-bond film score uh, this would probably be it I think it's it's quite possibly Barry's masterpiece and uh, it's extremely you know it's simplistic on a lot of levels because it is based around a singular theme for the entirety of the score but it's a very it's a very uh, moody and dark introspective album uh, very jazz oriented of course but uh, it's it's one I certainly can't live without and I've always loved the very stark imagery used on the U.S. jacket here with the red background. Of course, this being a uh, originally a stereo recording, uh, they had to fold it down for the mono film mixes and the mono LPs. Uh, so I actually would recommend having both the mono and stereo, but the stereo is a much better mix. Um, but if you've seen the film before in its original mono mix, yeah, you'll be more used to the way the music sounds on this particular pressing, which still is very good and sounds great. Um, it's kind of kind of hard to distinguish the mono from the stereo as uh, the cover imagery and the red background is almost identical. Uh, here you have the original soundtrack album banner across the top and of course the spacing and placements can be a bit different on the stereo copy which we'll get to in a second. Now the rear again printed black and white like most 60s soundtracks and you get this nice little blurb piece uh, written up about uh, Barry and his career up to that point and uh, it's not a complete score but it's uh, it's the vast majority of the score and as I said before it's based around uh, similar themes so that it, it plays well in the two side programs so it's a great listen as a record on its own even if you've never seen the film uh, which unfortunately most people in this country have not because it's been out of print in the states for years uh, which is a great shame because it's quite probably the best spy film ever made um, but I cannot talk about this score highly enough. Um, this is still a great sounding record, but I must uh, uh, must steer you towards the stereo pressing, which we'll go over now, because it's such a full-bodied, fantastic sounding recording that uh, even for the particular sound, I quite like it uh, simply as a, uh, not even counting as a soundtrack, but just for the sound quality of the pressing itself. So here is the U.S. stereo copy, which again is on Decca Records and looks almost identical, but you get the stereo moniker here on the top and the catalog number is a bit different. So that's how you'll be able to tell the two apart. And otherwise, it shares the exact same cover and rear cover, but again, the different catalog number and the stereo moniker on the back. Um, this one is not as worn as my mono copy, so uh, the jacket may appear a bit thicker, but it is a nice sturdy cardboard because, uh, you know, when you get to flimsier cardboard, it seems to not last as well over the years. But uh, again, the stereo mix is, is much more full bodied and this pressing is, is quite excellent. I'd, I'd actually say um, I actually prefer it to the CD soundtrack release, which doesn't add any additional material, just adds in uh, track cues of dialogue from the film. I actually think the stereo deca pressing scene here uh, is actually more full bodied sounding and is the best sounding version of the score uh, anywhere that I've ever come across. Uh, so if you're a giant fan of Barry and this score, I cannot recommend this US stereo pressing highly enough because as I said, I think it's the best sounding version out there and it's an amazing sounding recording and record for, you know, what's ostensibly just a 1965 stereo soundtrack. So uh, easily one of my favorite records in my entire collection and I can't play it enough. But uh, unfortunately they never released this in stereo in the UK. Uh, the UK got a different cover 
which uses film imagery and has the typical UK style um, of flip back jacket with a laminated front cover. And I never thought I'd actually come across one of these because it's not common to get uh, UK import soundtracks here. But I found this very luckily on eBay once. And so here is the 1965 British CBS original pressing with uh, this was one of the poster images used for many versions of the film in terms of its ad campaigns. And you see it maintains the same uh, logo and the same pistol as seen on the US cover. So basically you just get more of what you didn't see on the more minimalist US cover. Again, the front is laminated, so that's pretty nice. And it's done in the flip back jacket style. So on the rear, you have the panels that are literally flipped back. I do believe, um, I can't remember if this is the same uh, essay that's on the US one. Let me. No, I don't think it is. I think it's actually a, a different essay. And you get, um, this, is, this is one of my favorite uh, photos of Barry that's on a number of his uh, 60s releases. Again, it's the same track listing, but it is a mono LP, which was uh, the only way you could get it in the UK. For some reason, they never released it in stereo, although this was you know, around the time of Thunderball in the same year, which had mono and stereo copies both. So all of the Bond LPs in the 60s had both uh, mono and stereo issues up until You Only Live Twice. Uh, but for some reason, uh, CBS never made a stereo version of the Ipcris file in the UK. So this is the only version you can get uh, for, that was originally released in Great Britain. Um, I will say I do think it's a, it's a slightly different sounding mono LP to the US one. I think it sounds maybe a tad bit warmer. Uh, so if you are a an, if you're an extreme diehard fan of the Upcrest file score and of Barry's work as I am, uh, I'd actually have to recommend you have all three. <laughs> um, but it is very uh, rare to come across this original uh, British mono pressing, and in some corners of the internet, uh, I can go for a very substantial dollar amount. So you will be very lucky to stumble across a copy for cheap as I did. Um, so it's not essential, but it's really nice to have and to have it on the um, old-fashioned British red CBS label which I'll show you very briefly here just so you get an idea the US copies are on sort of the maroon deca label and again will indicate whether it is um, mono or stereo but here is the British CBS label that was uh, used up until I think the mid to late 60s. So that should be familiar to a number of people, but uh, that's what the British mono looks like. And again, I, I think it holds up very well, even though it, there is no British stereo copy around. So I think you, you would do well with any version of this score because it is an essential work, I would argue, um, quite strongly. But uh, anyway, I, I cannot speak highly enough of this score, which again, I think may very well be Barry's masterpiece in terms of film scores. So moving on to the second film in the Harry Potter and Trilogy from the 1960s, uh, here we have the US stereo copy of Conrad Elfer's score for Funeral in Berlin. This is originally, of course, a Paramount film. This is a uh, pressing by RCA, and uh, it's a little bit dinged up. This is a rather uncommon score to find. I think of the three films, um, it's pretty hard to find uh, the scores for the second and third, but uh, this one I don't even think has a... Um, I, I may be wrong, there might be a CD release somewhere of this, but I don't know that it actually has one. Uh, if it does, it certainly hasn't been expanded, I don't think. Um, the front cover does have a slight glossiness to it, and you get a uh, black, white, and red rendering of some uh, original promotional art for the film, which looks really nice. Again, this is a stereo LP. I don't know that there was a mono version around. I think they may have just made this one. Oh, no, I take that back. There is a mono version, is indicated by the catalog numbers here. Uh, but you don't stumble across this very often, and it's a pretty good score. It's very different from uh, Barry's work on Ipcrest in terms of you know uh, tonality and style, just as the film is. Um, I think it works really well in the film. I don't know if it's a score I'd necessarily listen to on its own, uh, but it plays pretty well on its own for, for that. And again, not a complete score, but uh, condensed down to LP programs. Uh, this copy is not in super great shape, but I was just happy to finally find it because it was the last of the three films that I had actually been able to actually get the scores for. 
And now we come to a score I absolutely adore that's uh, all kinds of beautiful, strange, and bizarre. Uh, this is the original 1967 Stereo United Artists pressing of Billion Dollar Brain. Uh, the fantastic Rich, Richard Rodney Bennett score uh, with the absolutely haunting main theme. And uh, if you've never seen this film, uh, this score is extremely out there, just as the film is. The film was directed by Ken Russell early on in his career. Uh, so this is an abrupt uh, 180 from the seriousness of the previous two films. It's still very serious, but it has this bizarre... Um, surrealistic quality to the film and that is perfectly reflected in this score which again is extraordinarily haunting and has all these cues in it that will simply not leave your brain practically ever uh, the, again this is the original 1967 united artist stereo pressing and i was lucky enough to actually find this still sealed so as you can see it still has the shrink wrap on Again, the cover is in black and white on the rear, and you can see in terms of layouts, very similar to Goldfinger and Thunderball and You Only Live Twice in terms of the placement, usage of uh, poster artwork, and then the even the typeface and layout for the track listing. Again, not a complete score, but it does give you a good majority of the score, and it sounds quite nice. Unfortunately, even though this copy was sealed, it had a lot of uh, inherent, it was a pretty noisy pressing. Uh, some cleaning helped it out a little bit, but that's sort of the danger you run into with uh, 60s uh, soundtracks especially. And uh, even seal copies do not necessarily guarantee that it's going to be a clean playing experience. Uh, this score was not reissued until, uh, I believe it was the mid to late 1980s when the MCA, uh, who had uh, acquired some of the United Artists catalog, uh, did a reissue of some various scores and for some reason included this one. So you can find it on vinyl in the uh, mid-1980s MCA Blue Sky uh, Rainbow label. And uh, if you have any MCA record from the mid to late 80s, uh, you'll, you'll know what that is. Um, it's, I show a little bit of it in my last video on the License to Kill LP. Um, it was finally released on CD by the Kritzerland label, but went quickly out of print. Uh, I'm not sure if, this, if it's a complete score on there, but I do think it added some additional tracks. So there is a version out there on CD if you really want the best sounding version of this score. Uh, but I do highly recommend it, just like I do the one, well, all three of these films, really. Uh, but this is a really nice soundtrack to have if you can actually find one. Moving on to a couple soundtracks I have for Stanley Kubrick films. Uh, this is the original Decca stereo pressing of Alex Norse's incredible score for Spartacus. And the LP for this is not in the best of shape, but the jacket is in great shape, so I picked it up pretty cheap at a local record store, pretty much for the jacket. Um, there is a beautiful, complete box set of Norse score from, I think it's from Varese Sarbond or one of the other labels. Uh, it's really great, but it's uh, a substantial, like a, a six or eight CDs, I think, and it has a very hefty price tag. So I haven't been able to uh, afford a copy of that yet, but uh, this has held me over for a good amount of time. Uh, it's got a really beautiful, glossy fold-out gatefold presentation. Again, if you find this and the cover's in great shape, it's very frameable. It's a beautiful display piece. Again, very, very uh, thick, glossy cover here, and just a gorgeous rendering of the uh, original campaign for the promotion where they had the various stars and the sort of gold coins with their likenesses on it. Now, when you fold it out, you have this beautiful drawing here. And then you also have, let's see if I can do this just right, a fold out of the battle between, of the fight between Spartacus and Drava in the gladiatorial arena in the gladiators training school. So this is a really nice touch and is not often found on these uh, surviving LPs because this would have been one of the first things to get uh, ripped out over the years or torn or lost. So I was happy to finally find one. It's a little crumpled here because it opens inside for the spine. Uh, but it's really cool to find one with the original poster. And then you have a nice pasted in booklet. Also, this is also very uncommonly found in these still uh, with really nice liner notes and some really well printed color stills.
So it's really awesome to find one of these that has not only the poster, but also the booklet still in it. And you also get some really nice conceptual drawings. So it's, it's a really nice piece just to have if you're a big fan of the film, even if, like I said, this particular copy, the LP itself is not in the best shape and is a pretty noisy listen. Um, but, you know, if you can find a copy it, that sounds pretty good um, in terms of condition, uh, it, it holds up pretty well. Here is the rear panel photo of the gatefold. Nice to see a more, uh, well, more interesting to see a more, you know, studio publicity shot of the two stars, because that is not indicative of how the film looks. And here is a piece on Alex North. I always love getting the whole uh, block of text about the composer themselves on vintage soundtracks. And then the rear, again, very stylized, but really interesting to see. And here you have the cast and uh, crew listing there and it, that it is a DECA Hi-Fi release. And here is the Maroon DECA Hi-Fi stereo label. This is the same label found on the US IPCRES files, so that's why I didn't pull those out because I knew I was gonna show the DECA label here. And again, if it was mono, it would not say stereo on the top. That's the big differentiation between the labels. Otherwise, they're exactly the same. And you get this maroon with uh, silver text. Now here's one you find in most uh, soundtrack bins because uh, I think they sold just an absolute uh, ton of these back in 1968. But here is the original MGM release of the 2001 score. Um, I, I shouldn't necessarily say score because of course it's composed of the classical pieces put in the film, but it uses one of the uh, original art pieces for the film that was used in some of the poster campaigns. And uh, it's a really nice jacket to have. It's a nice gatefold. Uh, unfortunately, this is um, a copy I picked up when I started record collecting, so it's not in the best of shape, but I've not yet found a uh, cleaner one that doesn't have a, a higher price tag on it. So. Again, a stereo LP. I don't think there was a mono version of this in 68. And then later on, I think about a year to maybe three years later, they made a second companion volume, uh, which has a picture of the Star Child as the cover. Um, but I believe that was um, less music that was actually in the film and just some re-recordings and other pieces by some of the same artists that were used in this film. Um, but anyway, uh, I think it's pretty well known that Kubrick originally had a score composed by Alex North and then in the process of making the film decided he liked his temp pieces of classical music so much more that he jettisoned the North score and uh, simply used those and that's what you have here and is iconic in the film. Uh, later on, the Norse score has been released. I believe it's available on CD. Um, this is most of what you hear in the film, but of course not all because it's condensed down to a single program. Um, the gatefold is very nice, and you get a nice little blurb about each of the tracks themselves with some nice color stills. And then the rear is just a continuation of the artwork. And again, extremely frameable and looks really nice. And one day I hope to find uh, at least a cleaner jacket without all the ring wear and such. But uh, you can get the score on CD with all the pieces. I believe it was Rhino who put it out under the uh, Turner Classic Movies moniker in the late 90s. Um, and then I think it's had a reissue since then, but I think it's still the same CD master. Next up, we have the iconic score from A Clockwork Orange by Wendy Carlos. Again, a little the worse for wear on the jacket, but still a nice gatefold with the film's original iconic poster artwork. And uh, this is a Warner Brothers pressing, since the film was from Warner. You get a nice gatefold with some nicely printed stills. Again, the jacket's a little the worse for wear, and it's kind of some of the white background has turned a little with age, but it still holds up really well, and the images are well chosen and printed. I will say the uh, sound quality of this uh, pressing compared to 2001 and Spartacus is a lot better because, of course, it's a Warner Brothers pressing from the early 70s as opposed to the mid to late 60s. Uh, it's on the original palm tree label, which I'll show you, which is pretty much the Warner Brothers label of the 70s show you that there. 
So that should be pretty familiar to those who have a lot of 70s Warner records. And here's the rear. Again, uh, really nice selection of tracks condensed for this LP program. Um, this was later released to CD, but I don't know if there's been like a full-on complete score expanded release. I think it's been cleaned up a little for CD, but not a whole, whole lot. And uh, again, the sound quality is really quite good on this LP. It's not one you come across all the time, but it's not really rare or anything. Uh, but unfortunately, anything that's even attached to uh, Kubrick's name usually uh, automatically gets a higher value of uh, put on with it. So you can uh, kind of search around a lot to find a non-beat up soundtrack from a Kubrick film simply to um, have one that's not uh, gonna be overcharging you a whole lot. Um, more images on the back, tying in with the uh, gatefold, and then you get a nice, it's a, referred to as a biographical sketch of uh, Wendy Carlos, but of course uh, this was when she was still known as Walter Carlos, which is why it's credited to Walter Carlos. Um, so anyway, I, I do think everybody should have a copy of this score, but uh, uh, you don't necessarily have to get this LP version. but. Uh, Again, I don't know if there's a really good complete uh, CD score out there or like a full-on remastered version, but uh, hopefully I can find a cleaner copy of this at some point, but uh, this is a nice placeholder until then. Now, moving on to uh, primarily the main David Lean epics. Uh, this one was one I did not expect to find, and it's actually quite uncommon. Uh, this is the original score for uh, the 1957 masterpiece, The Bridge on the River Kwai. And what's interesting about this is um, most of the time you actually find, um, this is apparently a mono score recording and this LP is mono, uh, but it's very rare and uncommon to find this original mono issue uh, because they uh, seemingly very quickly thereafter made a stereoized version that made a, a fake stereo signal out of the original mono and uh, that's the one that was mass produced and reissued and is on CD, uh, but you cannot get the original mono soundtrack without the fake stereo and all of the phasing that will entail uh, unless you actually track down this original 1957 mono 6i Columbia pressing. And the reason why I say 6i is it's on the original Columbia 6i mono label. A lot of jazz fans will know for trying to collect original mono uh, jazz records and especially Miles Davis albums that you want to find original 50s six eye labels. And here you can very clearly see that the original mono labels have six of the uh, CBSI logo on there. Uh, later repressings would have two and then eventually they dropped the eyes altogether. Uh, but as I said, most copies you find of this, actually practically almost all of them, are the fake stereo or reprocessed for stereo version that uh, really do the score a disservice. I, I really try to avoid um, any falk, false or fake stereo mixes if I can, and I just never thought I'd find this original LP. And very luckily, uh, there was a... Uh, a pretty substantial collection traded into one of the local stores with some rare scores in very good condition. And uh, this was among them. And it was actually with uh, at least two or three copies of the stereo version. Uh, so as I said, the stereo, uh, the fake stereo version is much more common. And uh, I'd say nine or 10 times out of 10 of uh, seeing this in record stores, you'll see the fake stereo version. So uh, if you come across a copy of this mono original, I definitely very highly recommend you pick it up because it's uh, quite likely you won't see another for a, an extremely long time. And uh, I have heard the, the fake stereo version, and, and it is fine, but uh, actually being able to hear the score in mono on this pressing uh, was a big jump forward in clarity. Um, and the, despite it being a 1957 LP, it actually plays quite clean. Uh, very similar, in fact, to some of my uh, Six Eye Mono Miles Davis albums from the same time period. Uh, really nice choice of stills on the back, even though it is printed in black and white, and you get a really nice little uh, soundtrack blurb there. 
So again, extremely recommended, uh, perhaps not as iconic as the scores we'll talk about next, but uh, still a very important score. And uh, the, I definitely cannot recommend this LP enough because it's really the only way to listen to the score properly uh, outside of just watching the film again. Now, next up, uh, we are, of course, going to talk about Lawrence of Arabia, which has, you know, much more complete releases on CD. Um, but I must say the LP program is still very, very good, despite it being condensed down for a single LP. But what I found interesting is there's a number of variations, so I'm not exactly sure which one is, uh, is first. So here is the first version I ever picked up. This is the stereo version on Colpix Records, which was, a, of course, a division of Columbia with the white stereo banner across the top and this rendering of the cover. Here you have the sort of pencil sketch version of Peter O'Toole with the uh, hooded figure from the original poster campaign. And uh, unfortunately, it's a little worse for wear and I could never get the price sticker off without uh, inadvertently damaging the cover. But all that put aside, it's still a very good sounding stereo LP from the early 1960s. And the rear uses the iconic artwork again and looks very regal and has a nice write-up on the film. Of course, this is the uh, work of Maurice Schar, and quite possibly, I, I don't think it's, a, a, I don't think it's really an argument to say that this is uh, his finest work, uh, or at least the most iconic. Uh, but uh, again, this is one of two stereo pressings I've picked up. I'll show you the Colpix label here, which is sort of a gold. I guess indicative of it being made of gold or worth its weight in gold or something. But uh, that's just a label I really thought was kind of cool looking. Now there were mono versions, but this being a stereo recording, I don't really think they're going to sound as good. Uh, if I ever do find a uh, clean mono version, I'll definitely uh, give it a try simply out of for curiosity. But uh, later on, I found this one that has, um, it's got the same cover, but it's a little bit different. As you can see, this was originally a seal copy, and uh, it does not have the stereo bar across the top. It leads me to think that this may have been a reissue uh, in terms of the jacket from maybe a year or so later, um, or maybe a couple years later, because it's very similar to the uh, Casino Royale release in terms of it being Coal Gems now instead of Coal Picks Records and it having the catalog number like the Casino Royale jacket. It also indicates a mono version on the back, but otherwise it's got the same artwork and because it's a sealed copy from obviously a couple years later most likely, uh, it's a little bit cleaner in terms of condition and printing, but everything else is the same. So I just think this is from a couple years later, but it still uh, sounds pretty, pretty much the same, actually. And then because I guess I didn't have enough, I have a third copy that I picked up. I, again, I think this is a reissue from a couple years later because it's on the Arista label. But here, with an alternate artwork, is another release of the same score program. But I think this is probably from at least the mid to late 70s, and they had switched over to this typeface and this cover image, which still looks really, really nice. And it's nice to change things up every once in a while, I suppose. Show you the rear. A lot more generic, but still it looks pretty nice. Again, same program, so this is pretty much just a 1970s or perhaps even early 80s reissue of the score. Next up, of course, we have Dr. Zhivago, which is also probably the contender for what is the best Maurice Jarre score. Now, this is the original uh, 1965 MGM LP, which they printed millions of these uh, because he sold like hotcakes back in the day and was a big moneymaker for MGM which kept them financially afloat in the mid to late 60s. Um, of course, uses just really lovely artwork and it looks really nice on the white background. Of course, sounds great in stereo. 
uh, is across the top. I don't know if there are mono versions of this. There might be, but uh, this record that was printed so many times, you find it practically everywhere. Um, so it's it, you might have to go through a number of them to find one in clean shape or an earlier plating because they reprinted this so many times that there's uh, uh, stampers get much later and later and later. And uh, the, of course, with LPs, you want to try and find the earliest stamper possible. Um, but anyway, uh, it's very hard to find an early stamper of this with the original cover and booklet and with an LP that's not been played to death because it seems like all of these were played to death. So this is an original jacket. So it has this gorgeous printing of Yuri walking across the snowy wasteland. And then you have the two side programs with a bit about each track listed here. And then what's really nice, of course, is that this is a stapled printed in booklet. I'll try and show you the best way I can. So you have a beautiful page about the music itself. I guess that you could say this is printed more in sort of a old fashioned storybook style, but it's it's really nice paper, actually. So, um, and they talk about the book, the film, the cast, the crew, and the music itself. So it's, it's a really nice piece to actually find uh, still in the gatefold. Try and turn these without skipping any. And again, some beautiful stills all printed in black and white, which look really, really nice. And the text is very good too. So here you have a whole panel of images as well. Sorry, I'm kind of jumping backwards and forwards, but I just want to make sure I'm able to show you all the pages. It's hard to do upside down. It's not really the perhaps the most informative booklet, but it's just really, really indicative of the film. And here you have this beautiful shot of David Lean sitting down for five seconds, uh, probably in what was in the midst of an extremely hazardous shoot. And there, here you have the cast listing with a bit about each of the main players, which is always pretty cool to see this element of a bygone era. And then the last page, like the front page, is actually pasted into the back of the gatefold. So the booklet is pretty much what you get in your gatefold. But again, it's hard to find one of these with the booklet still in there. And then because everything's contained in that booklet, the rear is just this lovely photo shot with this quote here. So again, it's hard to find one of these with the original jacket and also with an LP that's not destroyed. Um, I got very lucky finding this actually. Um, I never thought I would even look at another Jabaco because I got so tired of trying to find one that was an original and wasn't destroyed. Because it was reissued so many times, it pops up on a number of the different MGM labels. So this is on the earlier black MGM label from the early to mid 60s with the rainbow lettering of the actual logo itself. So that's an easy way to tell that you have an earlier copy. Uh, you'd have to actually look at the stampers and the dead wax to try and find one that was very early. Um, usually it's indicated by the uh, numbers being or letters used being much lower than uh, later copies. Now my first copy, I'll show you really quick, this was the first one I had, and it's probably from, I'd say, maybe 1968, 69. Uh, but it's the same images and everything. The catalog number's different, and it doesn't have the booklet inside. It's still a gatefold, but of course that means it's a lot thinner in terms of the jacket. Um, but this still holds up really well, and you get this lovely shot here. So it's still got a great gatefold. And since these are you know, practically a dime a dozen, you could actually get both for a couple bucks and just have them on the shelf side by side like I do. Um, I think this is most of the text from the original booklet just kind of crammed down in here because it's about the same uh, categories as the booklet. But of course you get these nice color images and this jacket is in better shape in terms of the edges and such. 
So it's not bad having a copy from this era. The rear is the same, but again, it's in a little bit better shape and then the catalog number is different. The reason I can kind of probably date this to the late 60s though, is that it's on the MGM label from the late 60s that's also on 2001. So I'll show you here with the famous stylized Leo the Lion that was only used for, uh, I believe it was 69 to 70 or something like that. Uh, pretty much most famous for being the logo used on 2001 and the 2001 soundtrack. And this still sounds really great. I, I would say the original sounds better because uh, it's um, you know from an earlier stamper, but uh, I have to say it's not that much different from this one. So if you have a later reissue of the score, uh, don't beat yourself up too much. But uh, the original is really nice to have for the you know original label and earlier stamper, and to have that awesome booklet. Next up is Maurice Char's score for the extremely underrated film Ryan's Daughter. This also released by MGM and has the early that stylized logo I was just talking about because this was just in the early 70s so they were still using that for a time. Really lovely imagery and not a super common score. They did print a number of these but uh, you know not a lot of people seemingly bought them and they certainly don't pop up as much as the uh, previous two films but uh, it is a really great sounding score and a great sounding LP so I do recommend it. Um, I don't think this has had a full-on complete score release on CD. So this LP is still pretty important. has a really nice gatefold with some great liner notes about the cast and crew. Some nice images and it runs across the whole gatefold. Of course, it's unfortunately black and white so there's no color stills but it, it's really well printed and again this jacket's not in the best of shape. It must have had some water damage at one point in time, but uh, it was very cheap and the LP is practically pristine, so I can live with that. This film was not properly treated on its original release. It got savaged by critics unnecessarily and was of course another giant roadshow film being distributed at a time where audiences really weren't clamoring for that. Uh, so I think this film got unfairly maligned and then very quickly and unfairly forgotten. Uh, I don't think, again, I don't, I don't think there's a complete score release out there for this. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it'd be great if there was. And unfortunately, the film has not yet made it to Blu-ray. There's at least a good uh, Laserdisc and a good restored two-disc DVD version uh, from Warner Brothers, but has not yet come to an official Blu-ray. There's a Blu-ray out there, I think, somewhere. Uh, somewhere overseas that's actually like just a, a bootleg version of the DVD upscaled unfortunately uh, but this is one that uh, really needs uh, to be rediscovered and this is a great way to do it at least for the score um, because the LP itself sounds great so very highly recommended. Now last up for Lean Films we have the Maurice Jarre score for Passage to India this one I very luckily picked up in a local bin, still in the original shrink wrap, so the jacket is in perfect shape. It's just a single LP, no gatefold or anything, but it's a really nice cover shot, and this is a really nice score, so it is highly recommended. This is actually a capital pressing, so it's a lot more common and a lot easier to find in good, clean shape. Uh, capital records from the 80s usually are, are great all around, so no complaints there. Uh, you do get notes about each of the tracks included, and uh, I do believe there's at least a good CD of this out there. Again, I'm not sure if there's a you know full-on complete score available, but uh, at least it's got a good presentation on LP, and uh, this is definitely an easy one you can pick up in good shape, so very much recommended. Now, next up, uh, going through the soundtracks I have for Sojourner Leone films, uh, this was a very lucky find. It's pretty uncommon. This is the original US stereo pressing from RCA of the soundtrack to A Fistful of Dollars, which of course was released here in the States in 1967 instead of its original 1964 Italian release. Here you have the original US poster artwork, but printed in really awesome color. Unfortunately, every time this gets uh, you know repurposed or something, they usually change the color. So it looks really nice on this jacket. And uh, again, it's on the original RCA Victor label, which I'll show you here, which means it has the original 
black label with the classic RCA Victor dog on the top. And of course, this is a stereo LP. What's interesting about this, um, it's not the 100% complete score, but it's very close. And uh, side one has the individual tracks, and side two lists the Fistful of Dollar Suite, which is actually just all of the tracks on side one simply uh, put in one entire program. So um, it is a shorter score, but that's just how they decided to fill out the second side on this US LP. Now, um, it is very difficult to find these, and unfortunately these films do not have 100% uh, fantastic complete score CD releases. There's a number of good uh, foreign releases overseas, like Italian and French and German CDs, that have uh, a lot more tracks, at least for some of the films, and are pretty close to being complete scores, but unfortunately there's nothing here in the U.S. that really uh, does them justice. The CD version of Fistful just replicates the uh, LP program and I think was done sometime in the mid to late 1980s. Uh, the rear cover is really nice and it's very uncommon to come across one of these, uh, especially one with a good jacket. So it was very nice to find, uh, but unfortunately the LP is a bit noisy. Uh, it's not perfect, but uh, I was just very happy to actually find one. Uh, as my previous copy, which I'll show you next, uses the same artwork but is a reissue from a couple years later so same jacket but is a bit worn uh, but this one I think is from the early to mid 1970s because it is on the sort of beige or tan uh, RCA label from the time period so uh, it's a lighter vinyl LP but uh, it's also, actually they're both kind of very crackly in terms of the pressing itself, but uh, I will say the uh, 1967 LP does sound much better. Um, I need to put it through another cleaning to see if I can uh, get it to uh, improve playback, but uh, it's very uncommon to come across uh, any version of Fistful on LP. They didn't seem to print a whole lot of them. Uh, and the same goes for the sequel, but I think the sequel got a bit more in terms of the print run because I've come across it more often than Fistful. So here it is, the 1967 United Artists stereo pressing of for a few dollars more. Uh, but don't be fooled into thinking this is the actual Ennio Morricone score uh, because this is a uh, re-recording actually by Leroy Holmes and his orchestra and it's uh, cues from the For a Few Dollars More score with other motion picture themes. So it's basically one of those compilation uh, soundtrack re-recording albums and other themes that you'd get all throughout the 60s but sold as the uh, soundtrack release for For a Few Dollars More. So originally I was not going to pick this up, but at the same time I found some of these other uh, really nice uh, jackets and copies in that uh, estate trade-in sale. Um, this was with the others and very cheap, so I figured I might as well because I'd regret it later because it's not common to find one of these with a really good jacket and LP. And again, you'd, you'd be thinking, wow, this is going to be the more corny score. It looks fantastic. Uh, it's got a nice write-up. It's got a nice still of uh, Monko from the film because in the films he has a name in each of the films, uh, which United Artists uh, would actually trim out of the U.S. prints. Um, it's very rarely mentioned, but they were there. He was explicitly named in each of the three films, but uh, as you can see, it's also credited as the man with no name there. This is actually a pretty good listen, and unfortunately it's the only official release of this score on LP in the US, so it's pretty much this or nothing. And there has not been a good US release of the Morricone score for this film at all. Uh, so this is pretty much what you're looking at outside of uh, compilations with some tracks from Morricone score, or some of those import CDs I mentioned before with tracks from the Morricone score, but um, for a few dollars more is the one of the three films that really has the worst score releases because there's so very little of the score that's actually on any of them. 
Uh, it's like maybe five to 10 tracks and all of them are very short or just individual cues. So it really deserves a complete score release um, just as much as the others, if not more, because it's the most badly represented. Um, so this is still a good LP and it's the only one you can really find that's a United States copy. But just be forewarned, it's not actually the uh, score for the film. And as you can see, it goes into themes from Top Copy and Tom Jones and even the theme from The Train, so other United Artists productions. So uh, you'll be very surprised if you put this on expecting the iconic Morricone score. So just be forewarned. And of course, in that same sale, I was very lucky to find a clean copy of the US stereo copy of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly from United Artists. And this, of course, uses the Morricone score and was the big seller for United Artists because this film came out first here in the States. And then the previous two films were released in the next year, um, sometimes on a double bill. Really nice artwork taken from the original US poster. So no complaints there. The typical 60s uh, United Artists stereo uh, wording across the top. The sound is quite excellent, and despite being condensed down to you know a single LP program, it gives you a good representation of the score and is very good sounding for a 1966, early 67 uh, American stereo soundtrack on vinyl. Um, so I definitely can easily recommend this, and it's going to be the easiest one to find of the three if you're looking for these original pressings. Um, but it's still not commonplace, so it will be much more expensive than you know your typical vintage soundtrack. Um, finally, after they did a CD release in the late 80s of this program, there was an expanded CD done around the time of that awful 2003 attempt at uh, making an English language version of the uh, three hour premiere cut of the film that MGM did. And uh, th that one does give you a lot more of the tracks and it is nice that you finally have more of an expanded score. Uh, but I believe there are several uh, European and foreign versions that go a bit even further. And uh, I think there was some loudness compression used a little bit on that CD. It's been a while since I've listened to it, so I'll have to uh, go back and listen to it again. But uh, it's an easy way to get more of the score, but still it's unfortunate that th none of these films really have uh, uh, full-on complete scores with really diligent uh, work done in terms of uh, finding the best sources and making sure that the complete score is presented. So. Um, these LPs still are important in a way, and they're an artifact of the original uh, you know, promotional release in the 1960s and the way United Artists distributed these out of order, for example. Um, but really nice to finally find one of these with a clean LPN jacket, and it does sound great. Now, unfortunately, I cannot say the same for the next one, which is switching over to RCA. This is the soundtrack release for Once Upon a Time in the West, and the jacket does look pretty nice, um, even though they have this red border here, using original uh, photographs of the building of the railroads and sort of a distressed, aged look, which fits the film's tone. Uh, but this was actually manufactured in uh, 1972, and so I don't know if there were any original soundtracks made on the film's release in 1968, but uh, for some reason this was made in 72, so I guess they either waited for a while or that one just isn't on uh, Discogs. But um, I'll show you the rear. It's a lot more generic, but uh, this is actually a relatively uncommon soundtrack to find, so I was happy to find one, but the condition is not so good. And as you can see here on the bottom, this being RCA in the early 70s, it's pressed on Dynaflex, which is, of course, the extremely thin vinyl they switched to due to the oil shortage. And some people have a real problem with it, but uh, honestly, I don't, because a lot of really great cuts were still pressed onto Dynaflex, and as long as the vinyl is in good shape, uh, it's usually not too, it's not really a problem that I've noticed. And of course, Dynaflex is, uh, you don't know if you can really see this, but it's very floppy. You can just do this in your hands because it's incredibly thin. Um, that's that's what a lot of people let it, let were, um, you know, will lead you to believe that it's a major problem. Um, it's not really with any of the ones that I have. The problem with this particular pressing is that the condition is not so great and it's very, very noisy um, and, you know, was not in the best condition when I picked it up. So. This one I really need to do a, uh, a 
full on deep cleaning on to see if I can uh, resuscitate any of the sound. Um, unfortunately, this does not have a expanded CD release here. They eventually did a CD with this same cover artwork and it's just replicating this uh, LP program. So that's available if you want to hear at least some of the score in decent quality if you can't find one of these. Um, there is a uh, expanded, I think it's even a two disc CD set. I believe it's from uh, Italy or Germany, I can't remember which. Um, and it has all of the, uh, the titles in Italian, so that could be a bit confusing. But uh, I think that one, if you can track it down, is the best version to have overall. Um, but of course, that's a, an import that you're going to have to track down. Now moving on to just organizing by composers, that pretty much does it for series and groupings by a couple directors and stuff. Um, this one is extremely uncommon and I was just surprised to find it. It's uh, actually a score I'm kind of fond of. I know a lot of people aren't and I'm probably going to butcher the composer's name so please forgive me. Uh, but this is the score for the 1965 uh, I'd actually go ahead and say the 1965 butchered masterpiece, uh, Major Dundee, directed by Sam Peckinpah. And this is the score as composed by Daniel Mitrithioff, which I probably just butchered in pronouncing. Again, please forgive me. I'm not sure the correct pronunciation of that. Now, this is a stereo pressing uh, by Columbia. I believe there are also mono versions of this, uh, but it's an extremely uncommon score to find, so it's quite rare. And I don't know that it's actually had a CD release, uh, when Sony did their uh, expanded version for DVD back in about 2005 or so, they were able to restore about 20 minutes to this film, which had been just butchered uh, by both the producer and the studio who basically took the film over from Peckinpah and uh, basically uh, sullied his name throughout the entire industry and then just dumped the picture out with... Uh, with it, this score put on and the uh, very cheery theme song that does not fit the film at all. So when they did the expanded version, uh, they also composed a new score, which I believe was done by Christopher Caliando, which hopefully I pronounced that right. Uh, and that is available on CD, I think from La La Land Records. Um, and that's what you hear on the 5.1 mix they made. Uh, but if you listen to the original mono track, this is the score you hear. And I actually think the score really fits the film pretty well and does a lot better job than the uh, newer score, which is fine in its own regard, but I just, I don't think it fits the film as well as this score. Um, so I was very happy to find this. And again, I don't think this has ever been released on CD. Uh, it's obviously not the complete score because it's condensed down to a single LP, but it does sound very good. And again, it's extremely uncommon. So this was just like an instant must buy for me. Uh, I, I really love this film. I think it's incredibly underrated. And if you've never, uh, if you've never seen it, uh, definitely check it out. And if you've never seen the expanded version, it does a lot of good things to try and reconstruct what the original intent of the film was, which I don't, I don't think had it been uh, finished as originally intended, I don't think it would be as some people claim, perhaps the uh, full on precursor to The Wild Bunch. But uh, I think it would have been a much better film and one of the best films of that year easily, which I still think it is. Um, and the, uh, you know, try in the expanded version where they tried to piece some things back together. But unfortunately, uh, all the other materials outside of that uh, 20 or so minutes they put back in has been lost. Um, so they basically did the best they could. And then the Blu-ray has gone out of print because it was a Twilight Time release. So um, this is really the only score release for the original score. So very highly recommended if you can actually find one because it is very uncommon. Now next up to a few John Barry LPs that are non-series and non-bond related. This is one of a number of uh, John Barry compilations that was done. Pretty much I think most of these were either on United Artists or like this one on Columbia. Um, but there's a number of these and they each have seem to have mono and stereo variations. This is really the only one that I have at the moment, and I think most of these are, um, a lot of these tracks are still unfortunately vinyl exclusive and haven't made it to CD. But this is the Columbia LP entitled Great Movie Sounds of John Barry, and it's the stereo pressing, so there's a mono version also as well. Um, so it's basically re-recordings that Barry did of uh, you know some of his Bond material uh, and then some of his other themes. 
So you get a really great version of uh, the Ipcrest file theme, the theme for Born Free, and then you get a great re-recording of the James Bond theme, which Barry kind of uh, would do from time to time. So there's at least five or six different Barry versions of the James Bond theme that pop up. Um, sometimes they get used by accident and you hear this different version of the theme and you're like, where did that come from? And then you have to kind of track it down by going through YouTube videos or different compilations to try and figure out which version, uh, which recording of the theme you have stuck in your head. Uh, so this has one of those alternates and has a nice write up on the back. One day I'd like to find the mono and stereo versions of all of these Barry compilation albums. There's this one, I believe another one's Ready For You, JB, and there's a, a whole host of other ones. There's also like one that was done as a tie-in for Goldfinger as well. Um, so these are really great for uh, Bond and Barry fans like myself. Uh, just unfortunately, this is the only one I've ever found in clean shape, but uh, you can track them down on eBay and other places uh, if you can't find them in your local record store. So these are, these are really cool and very indicative of the times and these compilation albums they would do. Uh, but these are all really cool, like brand new at the time, Barry re-recordings of his iconic work. So very highly recommended. I feel like I'm saying that a lot, but I definitely can say that with these soundtracks practically for every one. Now this one is a uh, pretty common one, but uh, it was nice to find this in clean shape, so it was a must buy for me. This is the release of Barry's Oscar winning score for Born Free, pressed by MGM, uh, as, as it was an MGM film. Uh, pretty straightforward jacket and everything, and on the MGM label. But again, not, not rare or anything, but hard to find with a clean jacket and LP, so uh, definitely recommend it if you can find it. Uh, this is also, I believe there is a standard CD of the Born Free score, but I don't know if there's like a cleaned up or remastered version. So uh, a clean LP will still do you very, very well. And this does sound quite good. So uh, I was just happy to find it in good shape. So honestly, uh, good condition is so key for vinyl soundtracks that uh, there are some I've picked up simply because the condition and the price was for so good that, um, you know, I just couldn't really say no. So sometimes that's uh, half or even like three quarters of the battle with uh, soundtracks. Now here we go with a really beautiful copy of Elmer Bernstein's score for The Great Escape here on the UA label. This is the stereo pressing here from the States using the iconic artwork and the jacket is just gorgeous. Um, it's really hard to find early 60s albums with jackets that are not destroyed. As you can see, this started to have a little bit of age wear, but uh, this was another from that uh, uh, estate that was traded into one of the local record stores, and they just got hundreds of uh, clean and some pristine sealed soundtracks. So uh, that's where a number of these came from. It's usually I go through um, a long period of time before I find any decent soundtracks, and then it seems that I find a whole run of them uh, at one particular time or another. The sound quality on this for such an early 60s soundtrack is actually really good. So again, condition is going to be key to finding these. Again, it, of course, it's not the complete score for such a long film. It would have required many LPs. Um, but this is a really nice presentation. The sound quality is excellent. Again, this is stereo as opposed to the film, which was in mono. Um, you get a nice write-up here. And uh, of course, it's printed in black and white on the rear. So not a common LP soundtrack you actually find. I have to say, I've not seen too many copies of this, but a great, you know, relatively iconic score, I would say, and a really nice uh, stereo LP of it, actually. Moving on to Jerry Goldsmith. This was another from that same number of soundtracks. This one was actually still sealed, so it was just <laughs> practically left into my hands. This is one you don't see all the time. This is the Goldsmith score for Our Man Flint with his fantastic theme for the film. Uh, but what's interesting about the soundtrack it's a stereo LP that's actually a re-recording. Uh, it was very common back in the day for uh, composers to re-record scores for the LP album version with like really great session players. 
primarily that way they could get you know better royalties and it would be a better uh, fidelity experience on record as well um, so eventually the film scores for both Arman Flint and its sequel in Lake Flint were released to CD um, you can also get these album versions on CD it's a separate release on a different label um, but it's really uncommon to find clean original soundtracks of them and they sound fantastic uh, so it's a it's obviously the same music you hear in the film, but it's a very different vibe because it was, you know, designed specifically for the album release. And this was a beautiful sealed copy with this gorgeous iconic artwork, which is just fantastic. And these were easily the best of the uh, spy craze uh, products that came out of all the rival studios in the midst of Bond mania in the 60s. So if you've never heard the Goldsmith re-recordings of the Flint scores, I, I definitely highly recommend them because they're a lot of fun. Um, but there is, you know, a bit of a different vibe as uh, compared to what you hear in the film all the time every time you rewatch it. Um, pretty generic in terms of the rear cover, black and white printing. This is on uh, the 20th Century Fox record label. Uh, but again, just not something you stumble across every day. And this was is still in beautiful shape. It was still sealed. It did have a little like a promo punch through it, but it's a very small one instead of a big hole. But uh, sound quality on this is actually really excellent. Um, I haven't picked up the CD version of the re-recordings. I'm very tempted to after really enjoying this listen of this particular LP, um, but I don't know if it's going to, if it's uh, any better or worse than the uh, vinyl version. Next up is another actually extremely rare Goldsmith score on record, and I spent years trying to find one of these. The cover's a little bit dinged up, um, but uh, the LP itself is in really pristine shape, and I'm just so happy to finally find one of these. I've gone through a number of copies over the years, and this is still the best one I've had. This is, of course, the Immortal score for Chinatown on ABC Records, and they didn't seem to print a lot of these, so it is very uncommon to find this original stereo pressing. As you can see, this still has the uh, promotional Not For Sale DJ sticker on it, which indicates this was a original stamper and a promo copy. Fortunately, I was not able to uh, save the price sticker. It's still kind of, th this isn't even the one that was on here when I got it. This is a much older one. Um, so I haven't been able to get that off and not ruin more of the cover. There's a little bit of ring wear and there's a little bit of corner damage, but again, this is the best uh, LP and jacket of this particular album I've come across. And I do love how they use the iconic central art piece from the poster on the both sides of the cover. Again, it's a single LP. It's actually a pretty short score. So this is, it's not a complete score, but it's, it's actually pretty close. Um, and the sound quality is excellent. Um, it's a really nice stereo LP. They did finally reissue it for Record Store Day a couple years ago, um, but I don't really know if that's going to be much or any different. Usually uh, uh, they just will grab whatever is floating around as a digital master and press it to vinyl. It does have a nice exclusive cover though. It was finally released to a good CD in uh, 1995. I think it's on Varese, which I have that one. And then there was another CD that unfortunately had some loudness to it. And then there's finally, uh, there's finally been a, uh, I think it is a complete score. It's got um, more of the score on there. Again, it's a pretty short score. I think also from Varese. And I've been meaning to pick that up. I just keep forgetting or putting it off. Um, but uh, I've got to pick that up to compare it. But um, the LP and the 1995 CD hold up very, very well. And uh, I think you could go with either one and be perfectly happy, and they both sound excellent. So uh, at least the, this score has good releases, as it so incredibly deserves, as it's one of the treasures of uh, 1970s film scores, and just film scores in general. Half the battle of doing these videos is getting stuff in and out of the jackets and back in their, protest their uh, plastic sleeves. That's what you hear me doing over here. Next, we have the iconic Marvin Hamlish score for The Sting. Of course, they sold like millions of these back in the 70s, so it's a very common score. Uh, it's just hard to find it in good condition. Uh, this is actually a pretty early stamper, and it's still in the original shrink. still has the original price sticker from back in the day, which is pretty cool. So uh, just something I always wanted to find, uh, find the LP version of it just uh, finally stumbled across one that was in good condition for the LP and the jacket. So again, 
not rare at all, very easy to find, but difficult to find a clean one. And uh, it's a really nice listen, uh, even outside of the film. And, you know, really kind of always brings a bit of a smile to the face, just like the film itself. Now here we have a really hard to find LP that I was stunned to find. This is the original London Records release of the absolutely iconic Anton Karas score for The Third Man. Um, it's not a complete score, and unfortunately only one side is really devoted to Karas's score, uh, but this is really the one main official release of the iconic Third Man theme outside of a 45 of the theme itself. Um, with other pieces from the film on the first side. And gorgeous artwork on the London label. It's a very uh, thick 50s style jacket with a nice laminated front cover. Um, and just really, really uncommon. Like this is very, very rare to find. There are tons of unofficial releases on LP and CD, but if you're looking for the original issue from 1949, 1950, uh, this is what you're gonna be looking for. And it is extremely hard to find, uh, let alone in good playable shape, which th this actually is. So this is one of those absolute surprise finds that still pop up in record stores. So. Uh, never never pass up a store when you get the chance. Of course, it's a mono recording and a mono LP. Uh, it has the old London uh, ear logo indicating high fidelity, and it actually does sound really, really good for the, uh, for the age of this pressing, and it's in good shape, so um, that I think accounts for uh, its sound fidelity. Unfortunately, there's not that I know of to date, you know, a fully restored, really good, complete score release on CD, which is really just incredible. Uh, it's just more and more public domain releases and compilations where you find the theme or most often re-recordings of the theme. Um, so it's really hard to find the original LP here. And again, just a real surprise. And not to mention, uh, there were not a lot of worldwide releases of this outside of the, you know, the uh, 45 of the theme itself, which sold tons. Um, and uh, it, it's very, very uncommon to find this original uh, Third Man soundtrack. And of course, again, it's really only the first side, whereas the second side is taken up by a duet of zithers, as it's put. And it does fit with the film score, you know, and it is a good listen, but you really wish that they would have given the second side to more selections from the film soundtrack. But um, it's just amazing that we got a soundtrack release at all at this time period of this absolutely, uh, this, this musical treasure. Now, after this enormous success of The Third Man, they launched into a uh, radio and eventually a television series based on the adventures of Harry and Lyme. And London did a tie-in for a short time period and did a repressing of the same LP but with a different cover updated to uh, match the new television series with Michael Rennie. And that's what is shown here. So this you will also find it's the exact same LP as the first go around. But I think it's done about a year or two later it's exactly the same in every way. This copy is not in as good of shape in its cover or LP as the first one um, that I have, but this was just another find in the bins and it's so rare to find either one. And I really like the alternate cover, so uh, I just couldn't pass it by because I figured, and I was quite right, that I'd never see another of either one ever again, and I never have. Um, outside of Discogs uh, listings or random eBay listings where both of these will still go for significant amounts regardless of condition. Um, so if you ever see either one of these, uh, definitely grab it regardless if it's in the worst condition possible because this is really um, you know, one of the only official releases of the iconic Third Man score, uh, even though it's, again, only the first side. So incredibly rare and important to have on LP in either cover variation. And uh, I think the reissue cover is actually a little bit more common than the original. So I, I may be wrong on that. It may not be either one, but it's just hard to find either one. Now here we have a really interesting one. This again is another uh, DJ radio promo from back in the day. Although I don't know exactly which radio DJs will be playing uh, selections from this score. 
<laughs> just over the pop airwaves, for example. But this is a uh, promo copy of the MGM stereo soundtrack of Ice Station Zebra by Michael Legrand with the original artwork, which is just gorgeous. Um, unfortunately, this is not really on the, uh, you know, the Blu-ray, or I mean, it is, but it's a lot smaller. So this is easily a very frameable jacket. And then it's got a nice gatefold, even though it's a single LP. If I can get this open here. And you get nice information about the film with really cool, very, of course, vintage looking uh, color stills. And uh, of course, there's a little bit of aging in here because you know you get dust and stuff trapped in here over the years. So it's kind of unavoidable after a certain point of being kicked around uh, record bins for decades. But um, this is actually in really good shape, and it's a really interesting listen, uh, even outside of the film. I don't, I don't really know if it's a great score, but it has great moments in it. Uh, and this is really, you know, one of those films where it's like trying all it can to be a big epic roadshow film, but it really isn't. So uh, I certainly can't fault them for trying. Uh, again, it's a single LP, so you get a good selection of the score that runs throughout the film, and you get a little bit of uh, blurb about each of the tracks. And then the rear has more art, which isn't it's not exactly a wraparound this is just another section of the film's original poster which the rest of it is the front cover image so really nice to find and not a super common soundtrack and again cool to find in good shape with the uh, promo dj sticker on it next up is another legrand score uh, this one is a really fun one it's the united artists release of his score for the original thomas crown affair and the use of split screen that's so iconic in the film is really kind of replicated here on the jacket. And I like the different use of color to really make it jump out to the record buyer on the shelf. Uh, again, not very commonly found in soundtrack bins. This is the stereo version. I uh, don't think there was a mono one because this is 68. And by that point in time, uh, UA had kind of pretty much, I think, phased out mono. Uh, it has the black and white rear cover. And the sound quality on here is actually really, really good. Um, by the late 60s, I think they had really nailed down um, uh, keeping soundtracks from being as noisy as some of the earlier ones were. Or perhaps it's just this one's in really good shape and wasn't played to death. Um, really great sound on here. And I don't know if there is like a uh, full-on complete uh, release of the Legrand score on CD or if it's just a replication of this LP program but uh, I definitely recommend this LP it sounds really really good now next up are a number of the scores for the Pink Panther films all of course by Henry Mancini um, unfortunately uh, the the second film a shot in the dark has never had a proper score release for some unknown strange reason uh, there's been a number of CD releases of these scores, but it's uh, usually like a hodgepodge or you find tracks on compilations or other uh, Mancini releases. Um, the most commonly released is, of course, this original uh, film score here. This copy I picked up still sealed in the original shrink, uh, but unfortunately it's not a complete score release. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think it's... Uh, mostly re-recordings and not the uh, film version. So uh, there really needs to be a complete version, uh, a complete uh, restored version on CD with the film version and the soundtrack versions. Um, this is the stereo version. There's also a mono version. And as you can see, it's credited as being a RCA Dynagroove recording, but as I'll show you, I picked up this sealed copy hoping that it was indeed that, but it is of course a 70s reissue which this actually does sound quite good I'm, I'm not uh, you know putting it down by any means but it uh, it really would probably be much bettered by a clean original uh, Dynagroove 1960s copy and a number of audiophile labels have put out their own version of this soundtrack and those sound great it's like um, there was one by the speakers corners label and there's been a number of others. So you can find pretty much a good sounding copy of this score uh, most anywhere. And uh, this copy also sounds excellent and the cover's in great shape and acts like it's an original 1963 or 64 LP pressing by having the Dynagroove logo, but it isn't. So, <laughs> uh, but still, it's a really nice copy to have and you know, you can't go wrong practically with any version of this score. 
Now, as I said, the second film, Shot in the Dark, has never had a score release. But uh, the third film in 19... Well, the third film starring Peter Sellers, I should say, not counting the uh, one-off Inspector Clouseau from, what was it, I believe 1967 or 68. Um, so coming back in 1975 with The Return of the Pink Panther, this is the Mancini score release for that film. And again, picked this up in really excellent sealed condition. And it does include a really nice poster, which I'll show you. Pretty much just of the cover artwork of the Panther himself looking extremely dapper in his top hat and cigarette in holder. So that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, of course, not a complete score, and uh, I believe some of these some of the '70s Panther sequels do have slightly expanded scores on CD. I think most of those are out of print, unfortunately. Um, but this one, it it has great sound quality. Of course, this is a RCA pressing from 1975, and uh, is in perfect shape. So I definitely recommend it if you find one in good shape, um, because unfortunately, none of these films have like full-on, beautifully restored complete scores available and uh, you know it's very strange you'd think there'd be a box set of all of the Mancini Pink Panther scores uh, in their complete form I think that would be an easy uh, sell to soundtrack collectors and just music fans in general but it's never happened for some strange reason so uh, hopefully that happens at some point but until then it's pretty cool and nice to have some of these original LPs also picked up a sealed copy of the sequel to Pink Panther Strikes Again. Again, not a complete score, but a really good presentation and sounds excellent. Uh, no poster in this one, of course, but uh, pretty nice jacket and this nice promo shot of the inspector himself. And again, it sounds excellent. And unfortunately, you know, there's no really great box set of all of these scores. So until then, you know, this is uh, doing pretty good for some of these scores. I forgot to mention this transferred back over to United Artists Records. And I believe, yeah, this one technically does as well because it's MGM and it was when they were already under the Liberty Records label. This one's a little bit dinged up, but it is a uh, not super common LP. This is actually a promotional copy, as you can see from the corner stamp here. This is the score for Trail of the Pink Panther. Uh, but it also has some cues and other tracks from some of the other films in the series. So this is actually a way you can get pieces of the uh, Shot in the Dark score on LP since there is not a official soundtrack release of that film at all. So that's really the reason why you'd want to pick this LP up outside of the couple tracks exclusive that were actually in Trail of the Pink Panther. Of course, this film was pretty notoriously compiled of outtakes and scenes from previous films after Peter Sellers had passed on, unfortunately. Um, so that means that there's very little original score actually in it. So that really kind of necessitated them using pieces of the older scores. So, I mean, that helps because you actually do get the shot in the dark theme, which is iconic and arguably one of Mancini's uh, best ever pieces, but was never officially released on an LP outside of this one. So anyway, I do definitely recommend this as sort of a compilation of various Panther tracks, but it is an oddball listen if you know about the series. And if you've ever seen this film, it's a very strange experience to watch because it's a combination of new and old material mixed in with unmistain, uh, most of the mixed in with unseen outtakes. So it's a very strange experience as a film. It's a very strange experience as a soundtrack. So they go hand in hand in that way. But I do recommend this score LP to have along with the rest of the series. Next up, we have the Miklos Roja score for El Cid, which is a supreme soundtrack in terms of composition, composing, and just scoring for films. It's just uh, just an incredible and beautiful piece of work. This is from the MGM Silver Screen soundtrack series, which I believe was a reissue program from the 70s or so. 
really nice cover artwork and it actually has a, a little gatefold here with a really nice information piece about the film. Unfortunately, of course, it's still just a single LP of this epic score, which is just absolutely beautifully made. Um, this is uh, it's marketed by Polydor, but it's on the MGM label. As you can see, it's from the early 70s due to the 70s MGM logo. But it's really beautifully done. I think this is one of the only major versions of El Cid on LP and it is on still on the MGM logo from this period. But uh, really, really sounds incredible for an LP at this time period. And of course, uh, the film I do highly recommend. Unfortunately, there's no good uh, HD Blu-ray release of this you know, roadshow epic. And uh, the best you can do is the old Miramax DVD or the Criterion Laserdisc, which has a fantastic uh, AC3 track where the score really comes alive. Um, but if you're looking for uh, the score on uh, Soundtrack LP, this is a, one good way to do it. And I do believe there, I, I, there's got to be a good CD of it. I just have never looked into like a uh, full-on uh, complete score release. But uh, just one of the great film scores and a really nice uh, MGM reissue. Now here's an interesting one. This is an interesting score for an interesting science fiction film that's not talked about enough these days. Uh, is really one of the uh, great sci-fi films of the early 70s. And um, it's, it's a really an interesting score to be paired with. Uh, this is, of course, the score for the classic science fiction film Silent Running, uh, as composed by Peter Shigley. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and it features, you know, the uh, famous Joan Baez song that's in the film and uh, beautiful artwork, just absolutely gorgeous artwork from some of the original poster campaigns, so easily something you could frame up on the wall. It's not a gatefold, unfortunately, but the rear has some really nice images, and I like when they would do the black and white printing, but on a black background like this. It makes it look different and distinctive. Uh, this is a uh, DECA pressing, but uh, after they had already transitioned over to being MCA. So this is, of course, 1971. So it's technically an MCA record, but it's still on the DECA label. And as you can see here, this is actually a promotional copy because it has the old school red sample copy sticker. Other than the uh, images on the back, it's just a single LP, nothing special with it, but uh, it was in really good shape, very clean, and anytime I can find a clean uh, promotional copy, that's uh, that's an easy sell because usually that means, you know, very first stampers played well, taken care of by uh, whoever owned it, or sometimes uh, DJs would just get these and put them on the shelf and never play them. So I'm always amazed when I find soundtrack LPs that were sent to DJs back in the day because... I can't for the life of me think of a, uh, um, a radio DJ pulling off an instrumental score to play on you know, a top 40 station or something. So uh, really, really interesting and not often found in uh, soundtrack bins. Now here's a really nice one that you don't find every day. This is a really nice find. This is the iconic Mission Impossible score for the television series as composed by Lalo Schifrin. And uh, this is the original Dot Records, which was an imprint of Paramount, who had apparently the television rights originally. And so they put it out on the Dot Records label. And so this is actually the, uh, the score soundtrack release for uh, Mission Impossible. I believe there's another one with some alternate themes and re-recordings that you find. Uh, but this is the one you want to track down if you want the iconic uh, Mission Impossible theme on LP in stereo. And of course, a lot easier than tracking down a 45 in clean shape if you just want the theme. Uh, so not super easy to find, but uh, it's definitely obtainable and it sounds really, really good. Um, the cover's in great shape and the track selections are, are pretty nice. Of course, they're pretty much mostly taken from the uh, first handful of episodes in the first season. Uh, but, uh, you know, it wasn't very common for television shows of this time period to get, you know, full on soundtrack releases outside of them being, you know, super huge, uh, you know, nationwide smashes. And even then, uh, it would be usually the theme with a combination of other tracks, not necessarily from the show itself. Uh, so it's really cool that Mission Impossible did get a full-on uh, LP soundtrack release. 
and it's a great way to listen to the iconic theme. Uh, apparently there's also a mono version out there, so as credited here in the catalog listing, so um, it's really cool to hear this in stereo, and it doesn't really sound like it's a uh, stereoized mono or anything, so I'm pretty sure it was a stereo recording to begin with. Uh, it sounds quite excellent for a 60s soundtrack, so very highly recommended and a really nice find. Uh, you can get, uh, there's a really great uh, score release on CD, but if you're looking for uh, this iconic music on LP, this is as good as it gets. This is the Dimitri Tiomkin score for the action classic masterwork, The Guns of Navarone. This is the original Columbia stereo pressing and there is a mono version as well. Uh, pretty much done in terms of the art as if it were a lobby card or a lobby poster for the film with the title layout and everything. And you have the stereo with the arrows as was common on a lot of Columbia releases, but they've given it sort of the uh, Grecian title font of the rest of the uh, film titles, which is a pretty cool touch. Unfortunately, it's not a gatefold, but this is in really great shape. Again, this is from that uh, estate sale of LP soundtracks. So I was really happy to find this in great shape. And again, has a really extensive uh, liner notes about the film and the music and Tiomkin's work. And uh, just a really great LP release of you know one of the great composers doing fantastic work for this absolute classic of a film that uh, is unfortunately, I think, not talked about enough in this day and age. And uh, it's one of those films that uh, every time you go back to it, it's, it's better than you remember. And its influence is so huge that uh, I, I feel like it's almost in danger of being forgotten by modern generations who have never gotten to see where a lot of uh, action tropes really started. Um, so a really nice release. Of course, there's also a mono version, as I said before. And uh, I don't know if anybody's done a complete score of, on CD of the Guns of Navarone score. So um, I, I know there's a, an early CD of this LP program, but I don't know if anybody's actually gone and done a complete score reissue. Um, I'll have to look that up because I don't think anybody has. So this is still a great way to listen to this score and uh, just trying to find one in good shape because this is, of course, a 1961 soundtrack. So uh, the earlier you go back in time, the harder it's going to be to find original soundtracks still in good playable shape with good jackets. So really, really nice release. Now moving on to John Williams scores, start with the original soundtrack LP to Close Encounters, which uh, even though they had they sold a lot of these, you don't find it as much as you do, say for example, uh, Star Wars. So uh, this copy it has a little bit of tape residue and it's a little bit beat up, but uh, the jacket's still in pretty good shape and uses the original teaser poster for the film and looks great. So um, it's definitely frameable even still in this condition. Has a really nice gatefold of the Mothership finale. So very great gatefold. And it's printed well, even though it's a, you know, sort of a thinner, uh, flimsier style of cardboard. And what was interesting with these is, I believe it's still in here, yeah. They also came with the accompanying seven inch, and this one still has it, uh, that actually is of the Close Encounters theme itself. So they printed this as a separate seven inch and actually bundled it in with the LP. So uh, it's not common to find one of these still with the seven inch included. So that was pretty much the reason why I picked up this particular copy because it was super cheap as they did manufacture and sell a lot of these back in the day. Uh, but it's hard to find one with a jacket that's not destroyed and still with the included seven inch. Now here is the rear. And I gotta say the layout and printing and design, it looks really nice and it's a lot more modern in its uh, design and setup than uh, what you were still typically getting by this point in the late 70s. And it is a really nice sounding LP, even though of course it's a very small section of the score itself. Uh, there's a really great new complete release on La La Land Records. They've done a number of the classic John Williams and uh, Steven Spielberg scores um, for a complete score release. So this, E.T., 
uh, Saving Private Ryan, a lot of the, uh, in, they've also done Empire of the Sun. So a lot of the Spielberg Williams collaborations are now available on their uh, limited complete score releases, which I highly recommend those. Uh, but if you'd like the score on LP, it's a nice LP that you can get for relatively cheap. Uh, just try to make sure it still has the seven inch still with it. And of course, we now have to talk about Star Wars. Now, unfortunately, this is one of the early LPs I picked up in collecting, so the jacket's not in very good shape, but the LPs are still pretty good. I've just never been able to find one to replace it that, you know, isn't put up with the usual Star Wars markup. It seems sellers and stores will mark anything higher simply if it has a Star Wars logo on it. So this is, of course, the original 20th Century Fox 1977 double LP. I really like the simplicity of this cover, and uh, you know, a lot of people are always wish it had post artwork and stuff. But I, I like the stark simplicity of using the uh, standard white logo. And even though it's damaged on the outside, the interior still is in good shape with the uh, images. And of course, so many kids grew up, you know, pouring over this that even the layout of this gatefold is pretty iconic. An original pressings of this, of course, came with a really nice fold-out poster of, uh, I believe it's some of the X and Y wings around the uh, Death Star trenches. But of course, uh, that this has uh, that poster was long since lost before I got this particular copy. I'll show you the rear, which also is very simplistic with this sort of ghost-like image of Vader's helmet among the stars. So I really do love this jacket. Um, just sorry to show you a copy that's so beat up. Now, the liner notes are pretty cool. They're printed on a separate sheet, and each theme is written about along with, there's liner notes about the entire approach of recording the score. And then what's really cool is the entire uh, orchestra is credited in the insert, which is a really, really nice touch. And so it's just done on a single sheet, but it's nice to still have this in here as most copies lose the poster and the liner notes and everything else by the time you actually find one. Now, a lot of people are not fans of the sound quality of this release, and it is, you know, a bit limited, I will admit. It was mastered by the Mastering Lab back in the day, which always did great work, but for some reason, this LP doesn't really sound as good as you'd think it should. And to this day, there's unfortunately not a great complete score release of any of the Star Wars trilogy, which is ridiculous to think, but absolutely true. Um, the best CD out there uh, that isn't the LP program, simply repeated, is from the 1993 anthology box set, but that had problems due to some tape degradation, and those themselves are not complete. Uh, when they made these special editions in 1997, they made two disc CD uh, sets for each film with uh, expanded scores again with new material, but they had so much loudness compression applied and dynamic range reduction that they're really not recommended. Um, and then those have been reissued a bunch. And they did recently do a vinyl soundtrack remaster box set, but of course that means they were sticking to the original release programs as shown here. So while those are really nice uh, cleaned up presentations, they are of the LP programs and not complete scores. So uh, as ridiculous as it sounds, there is no complete release of Star Wars um, anywhere. Um, that's, there's not, none are complete and none are perfect and there's not a really good one, which is quite sad. Um, but all that aside, I still think this uh, TML mastered LP uh, set still sounds really good for what it is. Um, so uh, don't let the bad reviews fool you. And um, there are later reissues on LP that are supposed to sound better, such as the British, I believe, Polydor label reissue. Um, but for what this is, I think it sounds quite excellent. And this isn't, uh, you know, this copy isn't in the best of shape, but I've listened to it for years and not had any problems. I will admit it's not the best sounding and the score does sound better on the anthology CD, for example. But, um, you know, for, for what this is, I think it holds up pretty well. But uh, it should be noted that uh, all three scores really need proper reissues. And, and complete ones, which still has not happened. The only other Williams LP I have is the original LP for Raiders of the Lost Ark. 
this using the iconic original artwork from the original um, 1991 release poster, except they placed it on sort of a gold yellow background, which looks really, really nice. So it's very frameable. It's all on a single LP program. And the rear looks nice, even though it's you know a bit more simplistic. And it has this really nice note from Spielberg himself about the importance of the score, which is a nice touch. So again, this is on Columbia, so it's just a single LP, uh, no deluxe treatment, unfortunately. Uh, this was later released to CD. There's a really great uh, expanded CD uh, by, I'm trying to remember which audiophile label did it, but it was mastered by uh, Steve Hoffman and sounds absolutely fantastic. Uh, there's an LP version of that that's incredibly rare that has a bonus track on it that's available only on that LP. So that's a real collector's item. And then it was later remastered and expanded again for the 2008 uh, soundtrack box set of all the uh, Indiana Jones scores uh, done to coincide with the Crystal Skull release. And, uh, but that's now gone out of print. I think you can still get the individual scores uh, separately. But there was a bonus disc in there with some additional Raiders cues, so that's exclusive to that. Um, so basically you have to get a combination of the 1995 uh, vinyl LP the 1995 CD, and then the 2008 CD box set to have, uh, I think that gets you like almost entirely the complete score. I think there may be one or two little tidbits not there, but that will get you like 99% of everything. Um, but uh, for the most part, I actually recommend that 1995 CD. It sounds excellent. I think it sounds better than the 2008 CD. It's not 100% complete, but it's it's darn near close. and. Uh, this LP is a nice companion piece for having a vinyl representation. Uh, Temple of Doom also got a uh, LP eventually, and uh, I think Last Crusade might have, but it was also um, pretty much CD oriented. Now, lastly, I have a couple soundtracks that are, you know, more compilations for individual films and not necessarily the work of a single composer. So, doing these chronologically. Uh, this one was one I picked up. It's actually a, um, it's actually, I believe this is a British pressing. Yeah, it's a British pressing of the iconic Easy Rider soundtrack. Uh, it's got the British flip back sleeve. It's laminated on the front and uses different artwork than the iconic US jacket. Um, so it's, it's a bit different and it's uncommon to pick up, but it's the same track listing as the US soundtrack release. So this is just one I picked up when I started record collecting, not realizing that it was actually a British pressing. So um, it still sounds good and it's stereo, whereas I think the US also has a mono variant. Um, but one day I'd like to find a clean uh, US copy to uh, have the iconic jacket and then um, see if it sounds any different to this British one. But uh, this is just a nice alternate version of a common soundtrack you see, but with just a different jacket because it's the British pressing. Now this is of course the soundtrack you see everywhere because they've sold millions of these, but it's one that really belongs in every collection for being not only a sampler of the era, but for also containing great music that sounds absolutely phenomenal. I'm of course talking about the soundtrack release of Saturday Night Fever. Now what's great about this is it's basically like, you know, the greatest hits of disco of this particular year and one it, to one extent. But it also was uh, mastered by Wally Trogett, the legendary engineer at uh, Capitol for many, many years. Um, so the trick is to find an original copy with his signature and early stampers on all four sides of both LPs. Uh, if you do that, it's really a nice, inexpensive reference record for anybody's system, and it sounds great to this day. I don't think any of the CD reissues sound anywhere near as good as this original um, Wally Trogett mastered LP. And here you have the iconic gatefold with shots and stills from the film. Now, uh, this particular copy is really nice because it's actually a promotional copy, as indicated, of course, by the gold stamp here on the rear. But not only is it a promotional copy, it's a very early white label promo copy, which you could always tell these as they have 
simply white labels indicating their uh, very early pressings uh, right after the test pressings were done. So this is really as early as you can get in terms of stampers. So, uh, and you wanna find early stampers for this record because they printed so many of them. And eventually you get copies that do not have the Wally mastering. The other thing is it's seemingly about a third to maybe about a halfway through the printing run on all of the various reissues of these. For some reason, it was decided to switch out the studio version of, uh, I believe it's Jive Talking, um, for a live version. So most of the time you pick up a copy of this in a used bin, and you know usually there's several because <laughs> there were so many. Uh, most record stores have at least you know four or five floating around them. Um, but if you pick up a copy, it has the live version replacing the studio version. So that's why I kept my original copy, which of course looks exactly the same, same gatefold, same rear cover, but this is a later pressing with the live version. And that side has the Wally mastering and none of the other sides do. So I just hold on to this to uh, have that alternate side with the live version of that song. Um, but uh, it's the only difference you're gonna come across. And that's an easy way to tell that you have an earlier version, uh, an earlier pressing, because it will still have the studio version of that song as opposed to the live version. So that's why I have two copies still floating around on my shelf. Now this is another one, it's extremely common. It's one of those that's indicative of the music of the era and it sounds great and it's cheap. So it's basically a must own, even if you don't really care about the film. I can't say that I do, but uh, this is of course the soundtrack LP of Flashdance. And the reason why I finally picked this up, it was still mostly in the string wrap and it was literally 50 cents. So uh, for, for that price, I couldn't put it off any longer because you see this everywhere and uh, usually not in the best of shape. Uh, it's usually, you know, this, the Beverly Hills Cop soundtrack, the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack, or uh, the soundtrack to the 76 remake of A Star Is Born, for example, that you see floating in every bin of soundtracks. But uh, again, you know, most of these songs are pretty iconic, even for people who haven't seen the film. Uh, people today have still know of them. The sound is great. It's a really well-pressed record from the early 80s, so there's there's no reason to, uh, you know, uh, frown on it. And again, the condition was so great, I couldn't say no any longer, uh, especially since, you know, you still see this pop up everywhere and trying to find a clean one is not an easy task. Next up is another one that's pretty much more of a compilation of artists. This is the soundtrack release for The Color of Money, the Scorsese film, the sequel to The Hustler, if you will. Really nice artwork, uh, a lot better than um, most of the video releases of this film, actually. And, uh, you know, a really nice, well mastered compilation of tracks that, uh, you know, you can get most of these, you know, on the albums they were originally from, but uh, this is a nice, easy catch all, and especially if you're a fan of the film. This is a really nice condition copy because, as you can see, it is a promo copy. The stamp is placed kind of over the uh, original barcode, so it's hard to read, but uh, that's usually where they would hide it. Um, and yeah, it's in perfect shape. So this was a this was an easy one since the uh, the Clapton songs in particular will get stuck in your head after rewatching this film. So uh, this was a easy purchase for me. Now this is my only Michael Kamen score on LP that's not Bond related, of course. Uh, this is the original soundtrack LP for Lethal Weapon. As you can see, this is a promotional copy, as you can tell by the moniker stamp down there. Um, and of course, even though it's shortened down to a single LP program, uh, it does a really good job at representing the score and sounds really, really good. Um, the mastering and the uh, cleanliness of this LP is really great. It's right up there as another um, LP, the uh, Warner Brothers pressing of The Living Daylights that I talked about in my Bond video. Um, both, of course, were from Warner and made in 1987, uh, so both Warner LPs sound excellent, as did any Warner LP from the, pretty much the late 70s onward, but especially in the 80s. Um, you don't see the LPs for um, Lethal Weapon 1 through 3 all the time, so they're not rare or anything, but you don't come across them 
uh, on a regular basis. So uh, this is really good sounding and uh, it's a good complement to the box set La La Land Records did. They did the uh, Lethal Weapon Complete Soundtracks Collection with complete scores for all four films. So that's really the one to go for, but if you would like a nice uh, LP to supplement that with, uh, this, is, this is really, really nice and uses great cover imagery from the film even replicates the title font of the main poster for the tracks, which is always pretty cool. So really, really nice 80s LP. Now last but not least, of course, this is again not the soundtrack, it's a compilation of tracks. Um, this is the soundtrack compilation of music inspired by the film Batman Forever, which of course is one of the more famous uh, 90s uh, movie tie-in CD compilations, which they sold bukus of, and you still see them pop up in uh, you know, uh, dollar CD bins everywhere. And that's a nice, well-mastered CD. And this is, again, one of the better compilation albums of inspired by a motion picture uh, releases that we got a rash of in the uh, late 80s and 90s. And so I was really interested to hear that, uh, you know, first there was a limited promotional vinyl release in 1995, uh, just in a standard white jacket. And I'd always wanted to get the uh, original 7-inch of the U2 song, Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me, that's included here in the film on the end credits. Uh, but that's usually pretty elusive and a bit more expensive because, you know, there are a lot of really... Uh, there are a lot of hardcore U2 collectors who try to collect all of the uh, vinyl releases of U2. So when I heard that there was a limited repressing, uh, this one actually comes from, it's a uh, limited release that came through Urban Outfitters. Um, I was very interested, and especially since it was extraordinarily cheap. I think you could still get this on their website for less than 15 bucks. Um, I actually got this one for about 10 bucks on eBay, if you would believe that, uh, which is nothing compared to what modern vinyl releases can go for. And uh, this is a double LP set with a really nice gatefold. This is one of the conceptual sketches for the redesign of Gotham City for the third film in the series. And uh, it's got a nice glossy sheen on the gatefold and the front and rear, so that's really nice. Otherwise it replicates the original CD except for the fact that you know it's obviously pressed on a, a 12 inch jacket and we're broken into four sides because it's spread across two LPs. Now this particular pressing is of course on colored vinyl. They replicated, I suppose, the uh, villain scheme by having record one be on translucent green vinyl, which, you know, I'm not really one for colored vinyl, but that's a nice touch. And then record two, record two is on a matte purple vinyl. So that is the exclusive Urban Outfitters version. There's also just a standard um, a black vinyl version, but that's actually more expensive if you would believe that. So uh, you can still get this version uh, for very, very cheap. Like I said, for about 10 to $15. And the, I think this probably just reuses the masters from, the, or the, the stampers from that original 1995 release because it sounds excellent. Um, not really a, you know, a dramatic improvement over the CD version, but like I said, it was a much cheaper alternative to get that uh, U2 track I'd always wanted to get the seven inch of, uh, but then get the rest of the um, soundtrack with it. Now here is the liner, which is just all printed on one sheet. So here you have a publicity still of Val in the bat suit next to the Batmobile in the back cave. It's really cool because it's all um, lit up with the studio stage lights so you get to see more of the set redesign. And then the flip side just has the standard credits for all the songs but spread out into the four sides. So um, like I said, I think it's just a, a repressing of the 1995 LP release, but this time it actually gets a jacket, whereas the original one was just in standard white generic um, sleeves and went for a lot of money on eBay because it was just like a DJ promo for clubs and such back in the day. So that's going to bring us to the end of my uh, soundtracks on vinyl LP shelf. Uh, this is... Uh, it wasn't, I did, never really intended to, you know, collect uh, a ton of soundtracks on, on vinyl. It's just something that over the years, you know, particular things I realized were only, you know, released on vinyl or were still best or the rough equivalent of uh, hard to find CDs. So 
Um, there are still a lot more that I'd, I'd like to pick up and really do in-depth comparisons of, but uh, unfortunately soundtracks are still you know, a niche market in terms of music overall. And it's really thanks to the uh, specialty labels that are really keeping uh, soundtracks alive. La La Land Records, Varese Sarabande, uh, Film Score Monthly is of course no longer making soundtracks, but they were a major force for a good number of years. Um, and then there's others like Quartet Records and um, just a, a whole lot of, of people still fighting the good fight. So um, it's it's still a, a methodology of um, you're not just collecting records, but you're also uh, you know preserving materials that have never made it to CD and finding out more information about some of your uh, favorite scores, favorite composers. So at least that's the way I look at it. So when I still buy too many soundtracks.